Welcome back to Bible study as we are continuing in our journey with the apostles through the book of Acts. And today we are on to Acts chapter three. Let's start with prayer. Holy and righteous God, you are the author of life and you adopt us to be your children. Fill us with your words of life that we may live as witnesses of the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. So with Acts chapter two, we heard of the event of Pentecost, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, and then Peter giving a pretty more extensive sermon and how thousands responded. Thousands came to believe in Jesus Christ and this very, very, very beginning early Christian community uh, lived in a way of sharing things together that they had, were told that they had all things in common. And so that's kind of where we left off and now we're picking up in chapter three and it turns toward uh, kind of what happens next, but on a, during that time, I would say kind of a, probably somewhat of a typical day around that earliest days in Jerusalem still. Everything centers at this time still very much around Jerusalem. And it has to do with what happens to Peter and John next. So we'll pick up in Acts chapter three and uh, going through verses one through eight. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at three o'clock in the afternoon, and a man lame from birth was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate, so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. It's actually, this is one of my um, favorite, favorite stories from the whole, whole New Testament, in part because there's a fun children's song that goes, goes along with this story. All right, so what we have a picture of though is again, I think this is very likely a pattern of what they were still doing, the disciples were still doing, the apostles now were still doing in those early days. And it talks about them, um, in essence, going to evening prayers, going to the temple. And it shows us that uh, they saw themselves very much as still faithful practicing Jews. They didn't, they didn't turn aside from their own Jewish faith, but they were, it was changing and they were understanding that they knew that Jesus was the Messiah, but that didn't stop them from still doing the kind of things that they had done throughout their lives in the Jewish tradition. And part of that would be uh, taking some time to go to the temple and there's various things, but in this case, it was to share in time for prayers in the in the afternoon. Well, as they go to the temple, the temple was uh, very very large at this time, and if you have in your Bible, you might have perhaps either in the back a picture that kind of shows something of a diagram of the temple, or maybe inside your Bible uh, somewhere. Uh, if you have the Lutheran Study Bible, if you will. If you want to look at page 1696 or 1697, 
you can see a diagram, an outline of what the temple was like, but it's kind of hard to tell because on the page it's, it's, it's just pretty small. And this was a really big place. And there are multiple entrances, multiple gates, but it's, it says that there was a man who had been lame since he was born and he had apparently never ever been able to walk his whole entire life. And in that day and time, there was no such thing as um, social services, social security. So the only way a person like that could, could make it in life would be to beg, to ask for handouts. And at the very least, though, he did have some people who would uh, bring him to the temple and it would make sense to bring him over right around the time when people would also be coming to the temple at a time, for instance, a time for evening prayer. And so just as uh, Peter and John are coming to the temple, the man who has been brought over to um, kind of hopefully encounter potential givers and uh, get some some alms, some some donations, some money, then they are coming along at that moment. And the man is just looking for a handout, looking for, for money. And when he asks for that, instead, uh, he, he probably doesn't even look at them. Um, if you can imagine having to do this throughout his life, uh, perhaps I would think that would have felt very shameful to him. And so he probably would not have lifted his eyes, not wanted to look, but just, just kind of call out and hope that the passers-by would, would you know, give him something. But instead, this is what's already uh, unique and different, is that Peter looks at him. How many people walk by and never really paid any attention? They might have even given something, but I doubt that they actually really looked at the man. And so Peter does. He looks at him very, very specifically. And then, and then um, he also says to him, and also John looks, and then he says, look at us. Now, this would be pretty unexpected. Going to the time of prayer and giving alms, uh, helping those who were less fortunate, those were both good ways of practicing your Jewish faith but taking time to stop and actually interact, that was, would be so, so unexpected. And also asking the man to, to look at them and again, not turn his eyes away, but actually look at them. Well, then they say the man does look at them because he's, he's hoping, um, he's thinking, oh, maybe they have something extra, uh, uh, extra, large gift of money to give to me. I imagine he was kind of looking up hopefully. And then they say something kind of kind of surprising, saying, ah, no, actually, we don't have any money. But everything they had would have been shared with all of the other Christian community. And remember, uh, when we were uh, towards the end of chapter 22, I'm sorry, end of chapter 2, Around verse 43 and 44, it said, Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the pre proceeds. So, so they were living in a communal sense. And so it, it wouldn't be so likely that, that Peter would be carrying any coin with him. They just all shared it together. At the same time, it's, that passage reminds us of signs and wonders. So something, something important is about to happen. And I think that's why Peter, along with John, wants the man to look at them. There's something happening here that is personal. There, there's no anonymity. Something amazing is about to come about. So then he takes him by the hand and gives this command, telling him to rise up in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk and takes him by the hand and the man 
doesn't it doesn't say that he just stood up it says immediately his feet and ankles were made strong jumping up he doesn't just just kind of like slowly get to his feet like i do after i might have been sitting in one position for too long uh no it says he jump up he stood and he began to walk so the healing is beyond anything this man has ever known remember he says he was lame from his birth he has never really been able to walk and he jumps up he leaps up and then he is able to walk and he goes along with peter and john to enter into the temple now that's also it might seem like a really small thing but it is also a very important thing that's being said right there as a person who had um who was disabled in um you know had a certain kind we call it a disability but in a certain way of understanding what was appropriate who could be allowed into the temple um the man was imperfect and it's would it in their way of looking at it in that time it would seem to dishonor god to let someone who was imperfect come before the one and holy god now we understand that god absolutely cares for everyone and in a special way for those who have some disadvantage but there was a actual expectation that was first related to who could serve as priests in the temple and let's take a look at that first and that's in Leviticus way back in the Old Testament so Leviticus chapter 21 so Leviticus in chapter 21 and verse 17 through 20 and this is um actually we'll say 16 through 20 and remember at the moment this is actually directed specifically at those who could serve as priests for the temple the lord spoke to moses saying speak to aaron and say no one of your offspring throughout their generations who has a blemish may approach to offer the food of his god for no one who has a blemish shall draw near one who is blind or lame or one who has a mutilated face or a limb too long or one who has a broken foot or a broken hand or a hunchback or a dwarf or a man with a blemish in his eyes or an itching disease or scabs or crushed testicles okay that's quite a list but their understanding again was that one who would be called to specifically serve God as a priest in the temple should not have any any kind of ailments or disabilities and that was again the intention was good it was meant to be showing honor to God and so from that time and many centuries going by something that was um applicable only to, really to priests who were going to serve God at a certain time got broad and and so extended so that no one who had some kind of imperfection uh was going to be allowed into into the space of the temple so this man as much as he was at the edge of the temple at the gate for many years i think we can assume he had never been inside and now he has been made whole and so now he goes along with Peter and John and actually enters the temple and then this is another one of my favorite uh phrases at the end of verse 8 walking and leaping and praising God and uh, again there's a there's a fun kind of Sunday school song that's made out of out of this story and and the kids can do walking and leaping and praising God it's it's a fun one all right well so next then um picking up in acts 3 9 back in acts 9 i mean chapter 3 verse 9 through 11 so he jumped up he went in the temple all the people saw him walking and praising god 
and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's portico, utterly astonished. And again, remember in that uh, verse towards the end that we had just read at the end of chapter two, it says, awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. Well, this is another one, an example of one of those wonders and signs that drew people and draws them together and it gives an opportunity for for Peter to start to speak, but it is it is something that they they couldn't quite comprehend. It says wonder and amazement, but it's it's not yet anything that pulls out belief. But the man, the man clings to them. The man knows how who was where the healing came from. But in case there is any confusion that somehow people might possibly think that, that Peter and John were somehow the, the source of the healing. Uh, Peter wants to, to speak and make sure that everyone understands where the healing really came from for this man. So we'll uh, take a look at verses 12 through 16. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people. You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the Holy and Righteous One and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. So the very, very important thing that Paul, I mean, yeah, that Peter wants to get across is that the source of this healing is nothing to do with Peter or John themselves, but it's absolutely through Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Well, not knowing how this uh, crowd, this representation, we could say, even of Israel will respond. And this, in a sense, in the way Acts is put together is, is kind of like their second chance. Uh, there was the first message that was preached on Pentecost. And again, the crowd there, not only is the people who are gathered, but it kind of, you could say, is a metaphor or a symbol for God's people, for Israel. And this is a second time for the opportunity to share the core message, the core message about Jesus Christ. And in this sharing this time around, there's a, I think a greater sense of urgency. It's, it's a bit stronger and it is, but he wants to hopefully help them understand that it is our God the God we have known, the God who has been faithful through all generations, this God, our God, is the one who glorified Jesus. And that's pointing towards Jesus' resurrection and ascension, which, which is a validation, an affirmation of all the ministry that Jesus carried out during his life, during his work on earth. And so clearly it's a way of showing that God gave approval to what Jesus was doing, that Jesus was truly representing God here on earth. And then goes on though to put what, who was responsible though for Jesus dying, for his death. And there is a, a sequence of you handed over, you rejected, 
twice, it mentions you rejected, you rejected, and then also killed, you killed. So that's, that's pretty strong. You handed over, you rejected, you rejected, you killed the author of life. Jesus is God's own son and Jesus is the one who gives us life, the author of life. And yet you put the author of life to death. Can't get much worse than that. And so, so that, uh, there's, there's no dancing around it. It's, it's just laid right out. And again, this is stronger than the message at Pentecost, but again, this is the second time for sharing. And so I think there's an understanding that they better listen. So he, Peter's gonna tell it to him really, really strongly this, this time. But the important thing is through Jesus, alone this man has been restored to the perfect health and you you have seen this you are aware you are witnesses with your very own eyes of this of this amazing miracle all right this wonder as they like to say wonders and signs all right well after this uh, rather intense challenge peter transitions to urge them to repent and also to be healed as the people of Israel. In a sense, um, just as the man who was lame was healed, what Peter is trying to present to the crowd, to this group, gathered group, who represents Israel, is that they could also be healed. They have that opportunity as well to be healed, to be saved. Healing and salvation, uh, the word is actually very close, sometimes used rather interchangeably. Well, let's, let's pick up in verse 17 through 21. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah appointed for you, that is Jesus, who must remain in heaven until the time of universal restoration that God announced long ago through the holy prophets. All right, some of this isn't hard to figure out. Some of this, I have to say, it gets maybe a little bit harder for us to follow. But interesting to me is after coming on really strong, he kind of backs off, he kind of suffers. He says, you, let's see, you handed over, you rejected, you rejected, you killed. And then he says next, well, Okay, you acted in ignorance, meaning you didn't really understand the message of the scripture, which was telling us, showing us who Jesus is, so that you could understand who Jesus really is. And so he wants to encourage them to, to repent from having handed over, having rejected, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out which is, I think, something we all understand that that is what salvation through Christ is, the taking away of our sins. And then, so that a time of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and knowing that the Messiah is among you. Now, this is something that I think in some ways at this moment, he is speaking very specific to this time and to the Israelite people. This isn't as uh, quite fully broad message it's something to this crowd and it's something to remind us to keep in mind that at this point and the some of the things that peter is saying it's it's a jew speaking to other jews this is not he's not speaking to jews and gentiles jews and non-jews together this is still kind of an internal family discussion maybe slash disagreement maybe argument and so this is trying to help bring along other Jewish people 
to come to know Jesus in the way that Peter and the other apostles and other, many, many other Jews have already come to understand uh, Jesus' uniqueness as Messiah, as the one that God sends to bring salvation to the world. And that as more can believe, this is something um, still of a mystery, but that at one point, um, Jesus will return. And this will be the culmination of history. But that's still in God's hands. And in the book of Acts, that looking towards Jesus' return, um, this is the last time that's actually really mentioned specifically. Even though early church, that was something they looked toward very much, believing that Jesus would return soon. Um, but then we know in time that didn't happen quite that way. All right, so really urging them though, turn to the Lord, repent, have your sins taken away, and you can have the new life like this man who, again, who couldn't walk, who was made whole. You could make, you can have that wholeness, that salvation as well. And then he turns to some scripture again to kind of um, show, undergird the message that he is trying to make. And so um, looking at verse 22 and 23, Peter, Peter does say this. He says, Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you from your own people a prophet like me. You must listen to whatever he tells you, and it will be that everyone who does not listen to that prophet will be utterly rooted out of the people. So this is something that Peter is quoting from the Old Testament. He's quoting from two places, both from Deuteronomy and from Leviticus, but we're just gonna, we're gonna just focus on the part from Deuteronomy, which is something that Moses uh, was, who it had said. And so we're turning to Deuteronomy 18. Let me see if I got that right. Yep, Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15 through 19. And this is uh, Moses sharing this. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people, and you shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever see again this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you, like Moses, from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of my prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words of the prophet, sh that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. So Peter is pointing to this message of Moses to say, the one who is this prophet is Jesus. The one that Moses was speaking about is Jesus. And so this is your opportunity at this time to repent and to listen, listen to this prophet, listen to this message about Jesus. Well, let's um, look at a little more, uh, the next few verses, 24 through 26, back in chapter three of Acts, 24, through 26. And all the prophets, as many as have spoken from Samuel and those after him, also predicted these days. You are the descendants of the prophets and of the covenant that God gave to your ancestors, saying to Abraham, and in your descendants all the families of the earth shall be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you, to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. All right, so again, he's, he's, he's giving it strong. He really wants people to turn to Jesus. Now, it's important to keep in mind, again, this is, this is an internal 
division or challenge within Judaism at this time. And also though, rather than a, a permanent separating, it's not um, separating the Jews from the believers who come to believe in Christ, whether they are Jews or not Jews originally, but it's, it's really more about a division that comes about within Judaism. And it is something that is actually foretold by Simeon, who was a very faithful believer. And we hear from Simeon in the beginning of the Gospel of Luke. So we need to turn to the message that Simeon, the prophecy that Simeon gave. And the occasion of this is that Jesus' parents have brought him to be presented in the temple. And this is something that every good faithful Jewish family should do. And this is what they were, they were doing. And Jesus was still just a little, little baby. And Simeon was there. And Simeon is grateful to God because Simeon had always prayed, could I see that I would be able to see the Lord's Messiah. And then this is what Simeon says in Luke 2, verse 34 and 35. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, this child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. A falling and rising of many in Israel and a sign to be a sign that will be opposed. So this is reminding us that at the moment what starts to develop more and more is there was a di big disagreement within Judaism. Is Jesus the real Messiah and one that we should believe in and follow or are we still waiting for one to come? And so to this day um, there are those who were Jews and became believers and Jews who do still become believers in Jesus as the Messiah. And there are those like myself who were not Jewish but believe in Jesus as, as Lord and Savior. But there are Jews who kept believing simply that the Messiah has not yet come. And so believing in Jesus does not overtake or replace or annul, make no longer good, the covenant that God made. And that, that is what um, also is referred to here, the covenant that God made with Abraham. And this is from Genesis 12 and verses one through three. And this is a pivotal, pivotal part of understanding what God has been about for millennia in relating to, to us, to humanity. So going back to Genesis 12, one through three, this is the covenant, promise, commitment God makes with Abraham. Although at this moment he's still called Abram. So Genesis 12, one to three. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So this is a promise, this is a covenant, this is a ongoing unending relationship that God makes with Abraham who was the the forefather of, of the entire Jewish nation, he and Sarah together. And so that never goes away. That, that, never, that never stops. When God makes a covenant, when God makes a promise, God keeps it. God does not change it. God may add new covenants, um, uh, additional ones, but those additional ones do not replace a former one. They only add on to. So none of the covenants that God makes ever go away. God just adds, adds a, and a new one and an additional one. And for us as believers in Jesus Christ, we understand that through Christ, um, one of the things Jesus said, this is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you, that Christ's sacrifice for us on the cross is a covenant which connects us into being also God's people. 
All right, well, in the same time though, Peter is using that same verse from Genesis to say, in your descendants, all the families of the earth shall be blessed, in Abraham's descendants, in other words. And looking to that, and a sense of which that all the families of the earth being blessed through Jesus, through Jesus Christ who has come to be the savior of the world, but also Peter is strongly appealing to the people who are right in front of him and saying, and he's there for you, he's to be your own savior. Well, that's as far as Peter gets in delivering this message, this, this sermon, when uh, he gets interrupted. So we're gonna see a little bit about that. A few more verses here. So now we are actually in chapter four of Acts, and we're going to just read the first four verses. So now chapter four in Acts, verse one through four. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came to them, much annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming that in Jesus there is a resurrection of the dead. So they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and they numbered about 5,000. All right, so certain leaders come along and they just put a stop to this. But guess what? Didn't quite really put a stop to it. Okay, the leaders. So this is also something that we're going to see being distinguished more. The difference between certain leaders of the Jews and then just the Jewish people. And unfortunately, um, the leaders are the ones who often are feeling most threatened. Uh, their position, what, they're, what they know, the status quo, uh, they, they're not in favor of changing that. And the Sadducees in particular, um, these were a group of wealthy leaders from priestly families. Now the priestly line, the, the Levites, the descendants of Aaron, they were meant to take turns serving in the temple. But over time, as this grew, there were more people than could possibly all serve in the temple. So uh, some of them just uh, grew up in, um, you know, they grew in wealth, and yet they were kind of um, more, a little more elevated status because they were from the priestly, priestly heritage, and they had gained in political and financial influence. And in addition to that, which is all kind of reasons why they didn't want things to change because they liked things the way they were, they also only believed that the first five books of the Old Testament were truly, truly, truly God's word, meaning Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And to their perspective, that never spoke about resurrection. So they never believed in resurrection. Whereas the Pharisees, who were accepting of what we consider the whole Old Testament, they did believe in the resurrection. That was something that they were actually looking forward to. Well, but I still think that the main, even though they claim that they're throwing them into jail because of preaching resurrection from the dead, that in actuality, they just don't want uh, to lose their influence. They kind of had come to a certain agreement with the Romans that were in power and they didn't want to rock the boat. So they're like, uh oh, this could stir up trouble. We better, we better get these guys out of here. So they had them taken into to jail. And this is the first of very many arrests that the apostles uh, get end up facing. Well, they want, the leaders want to stop Peter and John and from giving the message about Jesus, but they cannot stop the Holy Spirit. And with the Holy Spirit, we're told that thousands are brought to faith in Jesus Christ. Well, from all of this that we've gone through, through chapter three, and especially the reminder of what Jesus went through for us, uh, that he did suffer, that he was killed, uh, but that he also rose again. I thought a hymn that would be good for us to share is 
Christ, the life of all the living. join together in our Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And may you have a very blessed week.